So yeah, so this talk is really about um, the journey that you know I went through with Product Madness. Product Madness was a company I co-founded uh, eight years ago, uh, and uh, really bootstrapped into a company which is making uh, well beyond uh, 100 million dollars in revenue. So. Uh, uh, let me start by introducing myself a little bit, and uh, because I think it's it's relevant for a little bit, you know, the journey and kind of the the, the learnings for that. So, my background: I'm originally from uh, from Israel, so I grew up over here, uh, not too far away from here actually, and uh, uh, studied computer science, joined uh, Shimon and Matayim, so which is like the Israeli NSA. Spent uh, eight years over there, went over to Stanford uh, in California, went to business school over there, and then uh, decided to to start a company. Product Madness was initially founded, uh, was initially was supposed to be about, about uh, e-commerce, uh, that totally failed. Then we changed and basically, I guess we, today we call it Pivot, you know, back then we didn't know that, uh, that world, it wasn't as trendy. Uh, we started developing uh, viral applications that was a great business for a year and a half and then stopped being a great business. And then we switched into, uh, into social games and specifically we found success in, uh, in social casino. Uh, we sold the company three years ago to a company called Aristocat, uh, and since they managed to really scale the business, our biggest product is called Heart of Vegas, uh, which is uh, doing very well for us. It's uh, top 10 grossing on Facebook globally. It's number one top grossing in uh, iPhone and iPad in Australia. Top 10 grossing in uh, iPad in the US. I think num number 25, uh, give or take, uh, top grossing in uh, Google Play in the US. So it's, uh, it's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice success story. So, so during that, uh, that journey, really, what, uh, what did they learn? Um, so, so really, most of those, uh, those learnings are not specific to games. They are quite, uh, quite generic to, I guess, uh, entrepreneurship altogether. And uh, I think applicable across uh, many, many types of businesses. And of course, they're based on my personal journey. So that's kind of my perspective. It doesn't mean they're, they're right for you. And I'm sure you know, the other lots of smart people that will have different take on things. But uh, uh, at least that's uh, what I took away from that, uh, that experience. So first of all, uh, I want to mention a few things about starting a company. So uh, I, I always wanted to, to start my own company, but uh, for many, many years, what I used to say, uh, what I used to say is that, you know, I will do that in some point. Uh, I think what really surprised me when I actually started the company in the, the first few, few years of the company, it's really uh, a roller coaster ride. Um, so, you know, I think especially in Israel, in the kind of environments where, where we are, I think we, uh, you know, we praise entrepreneurship and, and I think it's great, but, but really I don't, I don't think it's necessarily the right career path for everyone. You know, obviously there's, you hear these success stories, but there's lots of, lots of uh, you know, people failing as well. And I think even when, I think what you need to be aware is that you'll have, you know, great days and you'll have really bad days. Uh, even, you know, and of course I can tell you that, you know, whenever I tell the story, typically, you, you know, you highlight the good days and you really skip the bad days. So, so what you need to be aware is uh, you need to be ready. You need to be ready that uh, emotionally, uh, and it, it's very hard to separate between your personal life and the company's life in the, in the early days. And when you have a good day, you're happy and going happy. And when, when you have a, a bad day, it's actually really draining yourself. So I, I would say it's a great career path, but it's definitely, definitely not for everyone. Uh, I would highly recommend when you start, uh, when you start your first company, uh, to, have, to have a partner, because when you have those bad days, it's really important to have someone to help you, you know, pick you up. Um, I think I know that there are people that uh, can do it by themselves, but, uh, but I think for most people, uh, even not talking about the skill set, even just you know, emotional support, I mean, may, may having someone there to consult with and, and just uh, you know, giving that support. So for me, you know, I started the company with a classmate of mine, a good friend of mine. His name is Jose Breton. So I think definitely in the first few years, it was really important for us to, to get the support from, uh, from each other. So it's, uh, it's definitely not for everyone. The, the second thing that you know, I used to say, and, and I still uh, you know, hear people say that today, is like, you know, I will start my company when I'll have this killer idea. You know, I'll, I will wake up one day in the morning and I will dream about something, and that will be like you know, something you know, magical that nobody ever thought of, of and, uh, and that will be my, my, my company. When I'll, you know, I'll have this brilliant idea in the shower, this is when I'll start my company. And, and, and when they do you know, have this idea, they don't, they don't want to share it with everyone because it's so valuable and so secretive. And really, unfortunately, or, or, or the reality is the ideas are really overrated. Uh, look at all the successful companies out there. They ended up doing something very different than, 
than what they started doing. Uh, and so, so really, don't be afraid about sharing your ideas. And also, if you really you know, decide that that's, that's the right career path for you, you want to start your own company, don't wait for this magical idea that's something that you know, we're going to disrupt the world and nobody, nobody else ever did. Because if, if it's actually a good idea, there's probably you know, 10, 20 teams out there in the world doing the same thing. Uh, and if they aren't, it's probably not a very good idea. And it doesn't matter, but when they're going to go live, you're going to, it's going to change five times. You know, in, in, our, in our case, you know, we started doing e-commerce, moved into you know, our applications, moved into social games, moved into social casino. Uh, but that's just one example. Almost every company out there really changed what they've been doing. So, so if ideas are really not that important, or at least not overrated, what is important? So the first thing is really the team. I think uh, if you heard Gigi this morning, you know, he talked about uh, you know, air players, uh, higher you know, A players and B players, you know, higher down, higher you know, C players. Uh, I fully agree with that. I think it's, uh, it's, it's probably the most important thing is really having, having you know, a super, super strong team. Um, and and it's, it's about passion, it's about you know, the skills, it's about the dedication. And uh, I can tell you, you know, I also do a little bit of uh, angel investing and, and the, pretty much the only, I guess the, there's two things I'm looking to. One is really the team. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, is really my next slide, which is, uh, which is the market. Uh, really, you know, when you have a great team, this, what, what, you're, what you need to make sure is that you have a good market. So, so what makes a market a good market? First of all, uh, size, size as far as money. Now, if you have a great idea and, and it's about, you know, uh, a toy for, uh, I guess, for dolphins, it's probably not a very big market, uh, although it might be the best toys ever for dolphins. Uh, you want to have, you know, find a big market, obviously. Uh, mobile games, it's a, it's a big market. Uh, there's lots of other markets that are out there which are, which, are, which are very big. And ideally, you want to find a growing market. What happens when you join, a, a, I guess, a big market which is growing or there are always opportunities, uh, and, and, and really ecosystems emerge. And I think you know we, we live uh, the social games, mobile games is really almost extreme example because of how fast those markets evolved. And really, you have you know initially you have companies really doing everything, and today you have you know full ecosystem. You can see all the companies outside, all the companies presenting here. You have companies specializing in advertising and analytics. You have companies. You know, specializing obviously in developing games, in publishing games. You have all those really, uh, I guess, areas in the value chain that we really presented opportunities for, for companies to be founded and add value in that eco chain. Uh, and if you get involved, if you have a good team, you get involved in B market where, where, where there's growth, you start with something. The initial idea is, I said, is, is not as important. And you figure out, as you get involved in that market, you figure out, I guess, the path that makes sense for you, for the team, for your DNA, how to create you know, a good business. Uh, raise money. Um, so you know, we we actually and it's coming from someone that uh, actually we we never raised any any money. Um, so we bootstrapped the company until we sold it, which uh, of course was uh, favorable in the in the cap table at uh, at I guess at the day of the sale. But it was uh, looking back, it was a mistake. You know, if you follow if you follow my advice uh, and do choose you know a, a big market that has growth, uh, you want to grab market share. You want to be aggressive. That's very hard to do without raising money. Uh, it's hard to do without raising money because, one, you don't have the money. Uh, two, even if you, you know, you're profitable, profitable enough to have the money, uh, make the fact that it's your own money just makes you very conservative. Uh, and you know, in our case, let's say you know, we had a new game, and you know, the right decision was to spend a you know, million dollars worth of marketing the first month. So you know, my partner and I said, you know what, a million bucks is a lot of money for us. It's our personal money, really. So let's spend you know, $10,000 the first week, see how it goes. Okay, it's going well. Let's spend $50,000, it's going well. Let's spend you know, $200,000, it's going well. Eventually, we'll spend the money. But in spend, instead of spending that over you know, the first month, we'll spend it over six months, which really, you lose something which is really, really key for, for a new venture, which is speed. Um, and it's very, very hard to fight with. Uh, so, so really, get money, uh, even if you don't have to, because it will, it will allow you to, to gain speed and momentum in the market. So a few things about uh, just about how to run your company, and, and of course this is uh, this is something which is uh, I guess evolving different as the, as the company is growing and and your role as, uh, as I guess as a founder or you know CEO of a company is really changing in a different stage of the company. Uh, so first of all, you know I showed this uh, slide to someone and told me, oh, you, you want to say that uh, you know running a company is really a marathon and not a sprint. So so yes, it is a marathon, not a sprint, uh, but. Uh, 
but, but also really there's lots of different things. You know, when the company is small, really you do everything, right? You do, you read contracts uh, and you, you know, you create graphics and you write code and uh, you do marketing and as you grow, you know, you have the ability to bring people to specialize in different uh, parts of the business. Uh, the one thing which is, uh, it, it sounds really trivial, but it's actually really, really hard to do is focus. And what's happening, especially if, if you are in this growth environment and you are entrepreneur by nature, you will see lots of opportunities around you. you you'll look around and say, oh my God, you know, I can start uh, you know, an ad network. Oh my God, you know, I, can, I can become an analytics company or I can create this type of game or different product. And so I heard about this other company which is doing super well, doing this other thing. It's very, very tempting because you know, if, if you have the, this, those, those, uh, those glasses, the entrepreneurship you know, glasses uh, that, that you're wearing, you will just start seeing opportunities everywhere. But the problem is, if you will keep jumping between all of those, you'll end up basically achieving not that much. Uh, really, and it actually requires quite a bit of discipline, is to figure out your strategy, sit down quietly, figure out what is your strategy, which you believe, you know, after analyzing the market, is the right strategy for, for you, for the market, for, for, for you know, the team that you have, and just then focus on that and execute. <clears throat> it's one of those things which sounds really easy, but it's actually really, really hard to do. And uh, I guess over time, I think we, you know, we, we learned how to do that much better. Uh, be, be liked. Uh, people enjoy doing business with uh, people that they, they like. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's true for, for you know, your partners, it's true for your employees. Uh, and eventually, you know, I think, you, know you, you want to create an environment that you, know, you enjoy uh, being in as well. So, so really, uh, especially, you know, Israelis tend to be, you know, very aggressive. You know, create that environment, create that, that, that uh, you know, be authentic, be yourself. And uh, I think uh, eventually, you know, that will lead to people, people actually enjoying working with you, which is really important for for you know, building your definition of, of your company. Uh, so I don't know if you know this guy. Uh, so his name is, is Pareto, and he's the, really the guy that uh, came with, the, the, uh, I guess this was inspiration for the Pareto rule, which is really the 80-20 rule. So what it says is really that 20% uh, of the effort uh, creates 80% of the value, and the last 20% uh, takes 80% of the time. So especially when you're, when you're starting, uh, you really have to focus on really uh, the 20% the that creating 80% of the, of the value. Focus, on, the, focus on, the, on, on those key, if it's game, focus on, the, on your core game loop, on the, really the key of the product. Go live with that. Don't try to aim, at least initially, for perfection. Test early, fail early, and, and really keep that in mind. So I think that's, that's really useful. I think we, there's, there's a tendency to, to overdevelop, uh, especially early. And that's something which is really, uh, can, can, again, cost you time, time to market and speed, which is uh, one, of, one of the competitive advantages of, uh, of a company, of a startup. You're going to make mistakes. And, uh, and making mistakes is fine. Uh, don't be afraid of making mistakes. The only way not to, not to do mistakes is, uh, is just not to do. Uh, so I think really try to, 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 I think try to, to make decisions early, uh, and it's okay if some of them are wrong. I think that's, uh, you, you want most of them to be right. You don't need uh, all of them to be right. So really don't be afraid of making mistakes. We, we made a million mistakes, uh, you know, building the company, uh, but hopefully, you know, we, we, we had like more right decisions than wrong. And I think it was all surprised, you know, what a big buffer really you have, you know, when you build a company that actually do mistakes. So, so really don't be afraid of that. Uh, so this slide is really about two things. One is um, fire early. So I think you know, when you build a team, uh, if, you, if there's someone who's, who's not a good fit, it could be, it could be you know, the best developer, or the best artist, but if he has a bad influence, if he has a bad influence of the rest of the team, really don't hesitate and, uh, and try to fire, fire early because one person can, can really damage the entire environment and that uh, can be very toxic. So it doesn't matter how much you interview and you know, how many, you know, the, your interview process and, you know, your filtering and the references, all of that, you always have bad hires. It's, uh, there's no way around it. Of course, you want to minimize it, but there's no way around it. I think the trick is when you find one, just really act quickly. I think, you know, we, oh, oh, you know, over the years, you know, for, well, unfortunately, you know, had to fire quite a few people. I think we never fired too early. 
um, it's, 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 you know, human, I guess, nature is the good. Let's give it another try, let's give it another chance. And, and rarely it, uh, it actually works out. So really, be strong, it's unpleasant. Nobody, nobody enjoys uh, you know, firing. Or maybe some people do, but uh, most people don't. Uh, so really, just, uh, just, uh, just act quickly. The, the second thing, really, is actually try to fire yourself. Uh, or, or always try to make yourself redundant. If you find yourself doing too much of, of something, try to, to bring someone who's actually better than you at this thing to do the full time. If you find yourself dealing too much with technology, bring a kick ass you know, CTO who's much better than your technology. If you find yourself doing too much you know, business development, bring a professional business development person to do this for you. If, if you find yourself you know, doing too much marketing, bring you know, a great VP of marketing. I think really, uh, as I guess a guy, a guy who's managing a company like that, you, trust me, you'll never be bored. There's always, uh, always things to do, but, uh, but you want to th th think about your last week, where you spend your time, and if you do too much with one thing, b bring someone to, to replace you. So, so what really is really important for you as, uh, as I guess, as a manager, a founder of the company, to, to focus on? I think it's, I think probably the most important thing is culture. And, uh, and you know, there's a saying saying that uh, culture is coming from the top, and it's very much true. And even though the company is very small, there's lots of lots of situ little small situations that you are facing, and really your decisions will determine the culture of the company and how it will behave, even when it's maybe a grown-up company or having you know, hundreds of th or thousands of employees. Um, what do you feel about working hours? Is it okay for people to, to come whenever they want to live and live whenever they want? Or is it okay for people to work from home or not? Uh, is it okay for people to, uh, to play you know, games on the computers during lunch break or not? Are you okay with that? Uh, there's lots of, lots of small decisions. Uh, it, now, what do you do when someone is late for a meeting? Is that, is that okay, or are you going to take a very harsh stand? And, and, and people will start behaving, the, the people are always watching the way you behave, and, and the, the way what you be, what demonstrate to them, that's really what they're going to start following. And th those really small things eventually become the culture of the company. Uh, and, and of course, as the company grows, you're not going to be around all the time, but, but I guess people that have been watching you, have been following you, that will turn into the way that they behave, the, the behaviors that they, they demonstrate. So even very early on, those really small things are really important for eventually the culture of the company that uh, I guess will be formed. And try to think about it, try to spend time thinking which type of company I would like to create, what, what is a company that, a place of work that I will enjoy working, working for, and try to demonstrate the behaviors that will, uh, will encourage that. So something else I keep hearing from uh, from young entrepreneurs is that, uh, you know, it's, uh, I found this great market, it's a great opportunity, but uh, I already found a company, it's a company, you know, in Sweden doing something similar and they already raised, they raised like two million, two million dollars. <clears throat> the, the fact that there's competition, it, it really, don't be afraid of competition. Uh, in a way, competition is, is actually really good. It's, uh, it makes you better. Uh, it's, it's validated the market. If there's some out there actually doing that, it's actually doing well. It actually means that there's a market, which is, which is a great thing for you. And, uh, and, and really, I think I'm not saying ignore competition. You know, look at what they do. You can actually learn from them. You, know, you can, might, might have competitors who are really smart and you can actually learn the thing too. Respect them, but don't be obsessed with them. You know, focus on your business. You know, stop once in a while, see what's happening out in the market, take some learnings, and then go back and focus on your business execute and execute and build you know, the best product and the best company that you can. And don't, don't be afraid that someone else is doing that. The, you know, even if there's no competition right now, they will be later. If there's a big market, you know, if, if there's you know, money to be made, there will be companies entering into that and trying to compete with you. So if it's, it's really not a reason not to start. It's a reason not to, not to engage in, in, in activity. Uh, in, a, in a way, I think you know, we, we're happy to have competitors. I think we have great competitors. You know. Uh, no, Platica is one of our competitors, and we think uh, you know they're doing a great job. Uh, and there's lots of others, and uh, and we are happy with that. And I think you know it gives us uh, you know someone to beat, and uh, and, and a place to and, and a place to uh, I guess for, to learn from, and, and you know they're they're learning from us and they're copying for us, and we have companies that 
uh, are copying from us, and, uh, and that's okay. That's, uh, that's really the rules of the game. So uh, I don't know if you have been to uh, uh, Sergio's uh, talk about uh, uh, Agario. It's, uh, it's a game by Miniclip. <coughs> uh, which did super well. Uh, we did super well in the last, uh, I guess, the last few months. So really, in the game, uh, you start as a small dot, and you can eat dots which are smaller than you. And uh, and as you as you eat the, the, the dots, you become bigger. And what's happening is, at, as you become bigger, you also become slower. And that's really, uh, I guess, the, the way companies work as well. Small companies uh, will always be faster than big ones. So, so go think, talking about, again about competition, if you see a big company in the space and say, you know, oh, there's no way for me to compete you know, with you know, IBM or whatever, whatever this, this company is, you should always remember that they're going to be slow because they're big. And I can tell you that when we, as we grew as a company, we became slower, unfortunately. It's very, very hard to, 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 to not become slower as we become bigger. So this is why there will always be room for, for new companies. There will always be room for innovation. And this is why innovation typically comes from smaller companies, because they, they, they are more agile. They can move much faster. And uh, so, so really, don't be afraid of uh, just be aware. Uh, use your speed, because you know, when you're small, that's really a competitive advantage. Uh, and, and don't be afraid of the big ones, because they will be very slow to move. So luck. So really, when I say luck, uh, I'm talking about really anything which is under, not, I guess, external and we don't control. Uh, and, and you know what? There's lots of, lots of things like that in our life. And, uh, and uh, lots of companies that uh, have been lucky and have been unlucky. What, what, what it means is that one, if, if you become successful, first of all, be humble. You know, this a, probably you also have been lucky. You have been, of course, you want to maximize your chances of being lucky. You want to try to be in the right place, the right place in the right time. But, but you know, eventually, you do, you do need some luck. Uh, if, uh, if there's a company that has been developing uh, mobile games just before the iPhone went live, if, if, if that, the, the, you know, the person running the company will tell you, you know, I analyze the market, I figure out you know, Apple is about to release a new phone, which can be touch-based, and they're going to become like a great uh, you know, gaming device, I would say you know, that's, that's an amazing analysis. And, uh, you know, Obviously, you know you earn the success, but if it just happened to be that you know they, they, they did that in just before the iPhone went up, you know they've been lucky, and that's great. But you do need to be humble, understand that you know you have been lucky. Um, and in the same way, companies you know can, can really become unlucky. You know, we you just happen to you know take the right the, the wrong turn or rely on something that still not that happened or there was a change in regulation or whatever that was, and that's okay. So I think you know if you. If you become successful, just you know, keep that in mind and, and, and be humble, because really there's lots of things external that really help that. And if you fail, really don't blame yourself, or don't blame only yourself, because there's lots of things really around you that probably contribute to that. So, so really, when you look at other companies, when you look at yourself, just, just always keep that in mind. Uh, you know, we don't control anything. Uh, and probably the most important thing, you know, because it's, uh, it's, not, an easy, it's not an easy journey, but uh, you know, we live only once. Uh, and we spend so much of our of our time, you know, in the workplace. So we we better enjoy what we're doing. So you know, we need to. If you find yourself that you're not enjoying what you're doing, you're not enjoy, enjoying the ride, you're not enjoy, enjoying the journey. No, do something else. It's uh, it's uh, life is just too short for that. So uh, so really, through this roller coaster, I, I guess it's it's for you if you if you enjoy roller coasters. And uh, if it's not, that's that's okay. Go go do something else. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So um, I'm happy to open the, the floor for questions. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, you were talking about the, uh, the way you behave in the company. Which approach did you take starting a game company? Like, so, so approach is what, how to behave in the company? How to behave as a CEO of the company. Like, Giving, letting people do whatever they want, and arrive on time <laughs> for meetings. So, or so you can ask all the guys over there; they can tell you. But uh, it doesn't do that. <laughs> no, I, I think I would say that we, if I have to say, I would say we have a semi-flexible environment. Uh, so what do I mean by that? For example, uh, you know, we are fine with people showing up 
if you want to shop in, in eight and, and you know leave at five, that's okay. If you want to shop at you know at ten and, and leave by at seven, that's okay. But we do ask people to shop by ten because you know there's a lot of teamwork involved, uh, and, and you, we do want people most for people to be there for the vast majority of the day together. I think you know we we try to show a little flexibility around you know personal things and really be supportive. Also trying to uh, to, to create an environment which is uh, I guess uh, a culture where you know people really socialize and we do you know lots of social events. In the same time, you know, where there's a, you know, a critical business need, we do expect people to work really hard and solve it if, it, if, it, if it's through the night or it's through the weekend. So we show flexibility on one hand, and on the second hand, you know, we do, we do, when needed, you know, we do require quite a bit. Thank you. Just a question about managing a company in multiple locations. Mm -hmm. so you, from very early on, in a separate location from co-founder, had separation in the company. Bad things, good things, etc. Sure. Yeah. So, so we are across quite a few locations. Um, so we have offices in uh, in London, in San Francisco, in Las Vegas, uh, in Austin, Texas, in in Minsk, in Belarus. Um, it's 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 quite a challenge. I think the biggest challenge is to is to make sure there's a consistent culture, and to avoid the situations where, uh, which is very human nature one, which is us against them. I think the key for that, I think what we realized um, quite some time ago is one is the key is really transparency, a lot of communication, uh, and a lot of travel. So I think really the way to create this, this uh, consistent culture is, is really to make sure that people spend a lot of uh, you know, face to face time. And the way we do that, you know, we allocate, you know, basically we allocate a lot of money to travel to make sure that people form good relationships and spend time together face to face. Otherwise, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, I would say it is easier to have uh, the entire company across uh, in one location, uh, but but of course uh, also time zone wise it can create challenges. Uh, but uh, you know we do enjoy you know being in a few locations as far as access to talent and as far as access to to different partners. Um, so so it's uh, but it's definitely not a, not a trivial task. All right, let's give a big loud shout out for Lior. <laughs> 